You are watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with HuffPost UK's political editor, Kevin Schofield, and The Spectator's economics editor, Kate Andrews. So let's see what's on some of those front pages for you now. Well, the Metro leads with Rishi Sunak's warning to his Chinese counterpart that interference with the UK's democracy will not be tolerated. It follows reports that a person working in Parliament has been arrested for allegedly spying for Beijing. That story is also on the front of the Financial Times. It says Rishi Sunak confronted the Chinese Premier at the G20 summit about the accusations. The spy saga leads the Daily Mail as calls grow for the government to ban Beijing from attending the UK's world first summit on artificial intelligence this autumn in response. The Guardian's top story tomorrow is the epidemic of preventable cancer cases sweeping the UK. It's estimated 184,000 cancers caused by smoking, drinking, obesity and sunburn will be diagnosed this year. The Mirror is leading with their Dangerous Dogs campaign. The Home Secretary has said the American XL bully is a clear and lethal danger after three people were injured in an attack by the breed. Meanwhile, the Eye is reporting UK interest rate hikes are set to end, according to experts. And the Star says millions of staff are planning on ditching work tomorrow to enjoy what could be the last day of Britain's heat wave. Next warning uh, to the Chinese not to interfere in UK parliamentary democracy. Take us into this story, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, it's probably not the headline from the G20 summit that Rishi Sunak in Downing Street had, had hoped for um, when, he, when he flew out. But, um, but yeah, we're told that um, the Prime Minister confronted uh, the Chinese Premier, who is at the G20 in New Delhi, um, about these reports, these allegations of um, Chinese spying activity in Parliament. Uh, we're told that he laid down the law, um, you know, said it's unacceptable behaviour. Um, the problem I think that Rishi Sunak has got, however, is that um, he himself has downgraded the threat level posed by China. Now, Liz Truss and Boris Johnson both said it was a, um, a threat, uh, it was an important word, strong word, to the UK. He, he um, downgraded that to a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, now, that has angered quite a lot of Conservative MPs, most notably Ian Duncan Smith, former leader. Um, and they have today, understandably, almost been saying, well, we did warn you that um, as much as uh, you see China as clearly an important economic um, partner, potentially, it's also a security threat. And as we see, if these allegations are, are, are true, then it obviously is a threat. And, um, yeah, as I say, it's put Rishi Sunak, I think, in a bit of an uncomfortable, uncomfortable position. Mm, but, but, Kate, according to, to Rishi Sunak, he's been quite uh, forthright in, in making his concerns known. Mm. It's not so difficult to be forthright. It's, it's difficult to take action on the issue. And, and one of the difficulties for this government is it won't just be a difference in opinion between former leaders and who's in charge now. You have very recent reports. January last year, British MPs were warned by MI5 about a Chinese agent who had been trying to engage in these kinds of activities. Just this summer, you had a report that was delivered to the House of Commons, according to the FT, about China's increasingly sophisticated espionage and that the UK systems were just woefully inadequate for dealing with this. So it has been flagged on numerous occasions, almost regardless regardless of opinion about how dangerous one country might be, to know that your systems and your security is just not up to scratch. And then to have a story like this come out, have these kinds of allegations come out, um, that somebody who was working in Parliament was, you know, known by the security minister, was known by the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee chair. People have come out and said, well, we, you know, we, we didn't know them that well, we didn't know them in our current positions, but the fact that they got to interact with them it's hugely embarrassing for the UK. And it's it's difficult to be able to say that they weren't warned that their own security systems, their own vetting processes weren't up to scratch. Mm. The Metro, uh, Kevin, pointing to the fact their headline, um, PM's China spy showdown. I mean, just how big a story is this at, at, at this stage? Yeah, I mean, it is a, a big story. Clearly, um, as Kate says, you know, this is something that has been, the government has been warned about uh, China's activities. Now, Rishi Sunak has decided on balance 
It's better to engage with China um, because of the size of its economy. Clearly, um, uh, it is economically important that we are able to trade with China. It produces a lot of goods, it buys a lot of goods. Um, but as I say, it's a difficult balancing act um, when it comes to the security threat that, that China poses. And this is, it's pretty embarrassing because this is, you know, again, if these allegations are true, it is proof that, um, that those warnings were correct and um, it, it calls the Prime Minister's judgment into question, I think. I think one of the interesting things about the headlines we're seeing today is that um, t this is the story to come out of the G20 and it's not the story that mm. the government wanted. Uh, you know, they would like to be talking about a potential trade deal with India, they would like to be talking um, about all kinds of, um, you know, uh, better opportunities for the UK amongst those G20 countries, amongst those advanced economies. And, you know, we've seen Rishi Sunak and others putting out photos of him talking to Joe Biden and him talking to Justin Trudeau, you've, you, uh, Emmanuel Macron. I mean, you, you've seen all of these um, uh, really great opportunities for there to be a story, but that story hasn't actually emerged. And the one that has is actually a domestic story and a rather embarrassing one. And I think that is also a difficulty for the government going into the week. Mm. And then just looking in a bit more detail, um, the uh, Metro's uh, coverage saying that some senior Conservatives have criticised Mr Sunak for seeking a relationship with China, which they see increasingly as a threat. Foreign Secretary James Cleverly was recently criticised for holding talks with uh, Chinese officials in Beijing. And we do remember that uh, the first time in, in many years that yeah. uh, a senior government, uh, well, cabinet member has attended and um, met with, with the Chinese. It, it is going to be very difficult for the Prime Minister to, to row back from this opening of arms to, to China that we, we've seen. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he talked tough on China during the Conservative leadership campaign last year when he went up against Liz Truss. When he eventually became Prime Minister, he then began to, to roll back on it, which was a marked shift because Liz Truss was very tough on China. Um, obviously, she's former Foreign Secretary, uh, so that, I think that... that um, informed her thinking on China a lot as well. So, yeah, as I say, it is quite em embarrassing. And as Kate said, this isn't the stuff that Downing Street wanted to be talking about, because we've already seen him, and we might talk about this in a little bit, the, he's had to react to the prisoner escaping as well. So it's almost like he's been blown around by events, number 10, and having to react to things that are happening to the government, rather than actually dictating and getting on the front foot, which is where the government is desperate to be. Well, let's move on to that story. You mentioned the um, the prison bake, Daniel Khalif, who's now been uh, captured, uh, uh, now back uh, uh, in captivity. We're just looking at the Metro, ongoing problem for the government. Uh, we spoke to the Justice Secretary um, earlier on Sky News and another incident with 40 inmates that have had to be moved out to, of Wandsworth as a, as a result, a, a follow-on from uh, the Daniel Khalif escape. It, it just doesn't feel like the institutions are working properly, whether it be security in Parliament, whether it be the security of a prison. It's, um, it's clear that it's not going so well. And as Kevin says, it's catching up to the Prime Minister even when he's out of the country on the international stage. Um, Daniel Cleave has now been found. It took 75 hours. Um, there's some note in the Metro about how that is considered amongst the police to actually be quite quick. As it says, um, you're not dealing with a, a, a television show, you're, you're dealing with real life here. Um, he was found, um, he, he, he will be charged with this properly tomorrow. Um, but it, it just feels as if the resources and the way that they're coming together is not always in, in our best interest. And we can talk about safety all we want, but when you have alleged security breaches, when you have people escaping prison, um, it's very difficult for the government to really focus on anything else. I mean, those are going to be top concerns from the public. So it's no wonder that that's catching up to the prime minister when he's in India. Um, but it is clear that uh, Wandsworth prison is, is still in a, a very difficult state. It's an aging jail. The resources aren't there. They're having to move prisoners out. It doesn't really um, scream confidence, does it, Kevin? No, no, it doesn't. And it's interesting, actually, inside the, the, the story, um, there's a separate story about an inmate being stabbed at Wandsworth uh, Prison after Daniel Khalif um, escaped. He's critically ill now in hospital. And it just, I think, it plays into this idea. And, it, and it's obviously unfortunate that it's um, it's caused, or that, uh, it, that we aren't focusing on this usually. And this has all mm. come as a result of um, uh, Daniel Khalif escaping. But 
Alex Shock talks about the 40 that they've moved out to other prisons. Mm. You don't explain why these 40 have no. been moving, why those specific 40, and Might if Daniel, the back and if Daniel Khalifa hadn't escaped, presumably yeah. those 40 would still so, be in yeah. there. And, you know, obviously it's now been deemed necessary yeah, to move them. So, a again, it's, it's shown that the government yeah, doesn't question it's, it's that we do need to events uh, rather than... We do need an dictating. answer to Kevin and Kate for the minute. Thank you. We are going to take a break. Coming up, uh, an interesting story about interest rates. Uh, we'll tell you more in a moment. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview. Still with me, Kevin Schofield and Kate Andrews. Let us take a look at the uh, front page of the Eye, and hopefully this is a uh, good news. We think possibly on the surface it seems like a very good news uh, story. UK interest rate hike set to end. Uh, an expert panel has predicted. Kate, take us into this. Yes. So the the Eye seems to have spoken to some economists who are forecasting that inflation may not rise to the 6% that's been expected by the end of the year. Market expectation is still that it will rise to around 6%, but to be fair, that has been falling for some time, and it was above 6% for a while. Uh, and this comes after the governor of the Bank uh, of England, Andrew Bailey, spoke to the Treasury Select Committee this past week, and he said that he thought we were moving out of the time where interest rate hikes were necessary and into a time where that was a bit more vague. Now, to be very clear, he did not say we're not going to see another interest rate hike. That's not up to him. That's up to his whole uh, monetary policy committee. They will vote and they will come up with an answer to that question towards the end of the month. Um, but there are a few events this month to look out for. Um, one is obviously the next round of inflation figures, which we get in a few weeks' time. But one is this week. I think it's on Tuesday. We get the latest labour market update, and that will show how quickly wages are rising in the public and private sector. We know the bank is following those figures closely. They are concerned about the concept of a wage price spiral, that wages will bring us a secondary round of inflation. A lot of economists are skeptical of that claim, but we do know that that's what the bank is looking at. So that will be an interesting update. Um, and the suggestion here is that, you know, a wide range of things could happen. We could see rates go up further. We could see the bank decide to hold and raise rates again down the line. Um, but, you know, anybody who has outstanding debt, anybody who has a mortgage is very much looking for that the pause mm. Indeed. on this figure. And, you know, in theory, we could be getting that sooner than expected. Well, this panel of experts uh, are predicting that there may only be one more interest rate rise, um, Kevin. But, but just reading this, you forget that there have been 14, yeah. 14 consecutive increases. Yeah, um, we've almost got used to it. Now, after such a long period, obviously, of mm. unusually low um, interest rates, now, the slight health warning is that Jeremy Hunt did say last week that he expects inflation to go up again a little bit this month. So I would take this just with a slight pinch of salt, but the government will certainly be hoping that these predictions are correct. They want, you know, by the end of the year, interest rates certainly to have levelled off, if not coming down. Inflation to be around about 5%, um, and then they can go into the new year, hopefully with a, a better story to tell uh, voters as we anticipate the general election will be taking place, mm. possibly but as early as next spring. The negative at the end of this is that some other economists remain pessimistic, warning British inflation is not under well, control. that's economists for you, isn't it? Oh. They're always, they're always different opinions. That's your lot, Kate, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they try hard. <laughs> they try hard. We've just got time for the weather. Now, no, both of you will be at work tomorrow. You're not one of these um, Established that people yes. that are pulling a, a sickie <laughs> to enjoy the, the sun. But we've got another day of a heat wave weather, Kate. Thankfully, this looks like the last day. Um, the Thankfully, have you not enjoyed well, the, it? The Daily Star is reporting that millions of staff are ditching work to enjoy this weather. I don't really know who's enjoying it at this point. It's just too hot, given that the infrastructure in the UK is not especially conducive to such hot weather. I don't know how people are escaping it. I want to escape. I don't want to indulge in it. But um, it, I, it is supposed to start to cool off. We might get some lovely autumnal weather in the weeks to come. You will miss it when it's gone. Mark my words, you will. Kevin? Yeah, well, I'm Scottish, you see, so this, is, <laughs> this is unusual weather for me, to put it mildly. Um, yeah, I don't enjoy it at all. It's OK when you're on holiday and you're expecting it to be hot and there's maybe air conditioning, might even be a swimming pool for you to cool off. But in Britain, it's just, well, there's no yeah. air con. The uh, American in me says it's OK when there's access to air conditioning, yeah, which is just, just so and then you can sleep. <laughs> but then we, we like nothing better in this country than complaining about the weather. We will complain in a couple of weeks' time when it's freezing cold again.